Sarah, I'm one of the ethical doctors here at St George's. Um, Ms Nolan kindly agreed to join me today to answer a few questions about chronic glaucoma. So thanks so much for being with us today. You're welcome. So to start with, how can we define chronic glaucoma? So it's, um, it's quite a difficult definition, but the way we define it is as a optic neuropathy, mm -hmm. so an abnormality of the optic nerve, which is characterised by a typical structural changes that you visualise in the optic nerve and functional changes <coughs> in the visual field. And um, those changes typically are changes to the neuroretinal rim, which can be focal or diffuse but often in the either the inferior or the superior aspect of the optic nerve. And then associated with that, the visual field changes are forms of scotoma, so areas of loss of vision within, or depressed sensitivity within the visual field. And those are classically what are called arcuate scotomas, so they arch around from the blind spot or nasal steps. So often, usually, as people probably know, it, it affects the periphery, periphery of the vision first, and then in advanced stages can affect the central vision. So that's how it's defined. So how common is glaucoma? So in um, the UK population, in a Caucasian population, surveys have shown it to affect about 1% of the population over 40, 2% of the population over 50. And as people get older, um, it, obviously it becomes more common. In other populations, for example, African-derived people, they have a much higher risk and a common prevalence of it. So a recent survey conducted in West Africa, in Ghana, found the prevalence to be 6% of people aged 40 and above. So that obviously has implications for populations who live in this country who are African-Caribbean, for example. Um, so primary open-angle glaucoma has that sort of prevalence and again it, in Afro-Caribbean people it, it affects them more severely and at a younger age as well. Okay. So you mentioned primary open angle, so how do we sort of split up and classify glaucoma? So the primary glaucomas, so that's where the glaucoma itself is the disease, it's not caused by another condition, are divided mainly into primary open angle glaucoma mm -hmm. and uh, primary angle closure glaucoma. So how you determine that is by examining the angle and the trabecular meshwork. And that's where the fluid drains out of the eye. And in open angle glaucoma, there's no obvious obstruction to the fluid getting out of the eye. But there is probably some uh, kind of um, extracellular uh, changes in the collagen matrix which are obstructing it and nothing visible and in primary angle closure glaucoma you will see the peripheral iris closing off the drainage angle when you do a test called gonioscopy yeah. so those are the two main types and then you've got secondary glaucomas as well okay so with primary open angle glaucoma how do patients tend to present what are their symptoms uh, they usually don't have any symptoms, right. so the commonest way they present is that they're picked up routinely by their opticians on mm -hmm. screening. So in this country, anyone aged 50 and above gets free glaucoma checks when they go for their sight test. And if they're aged 40 and above and they have a family history of the disease, they get that as well. So the opticians will do a few tests like a quick puff to check the pressure, mm -hmm. look at the optic nerve, maybe do a quick visual field test. And if those are abnormal, they'll refer them in to us. Occasionally people will present having lost vision in one eye, but that's very advanced age, mm -hmm. very high pressures normally. Right. So you mentioned visual loss, what are the risks then with glaucoma? Is it purely visual loss? Uh, yes, really. Um, yeah. And it's quite important to remember that they can retain their central visual acuity okay. and still only have 10 degrees of central visual field, so they're actually very visually impaired and very disabled yeah. and if you see a patient with advanced glaucoma walking around they find it very difficult to navigate they've got a very constricted field of vision so they may be a lot worse off than someone who for example has macular degeneration mm -hmm. with reduced visual acuity um, so that's that's quite important to remember about glaucoma it's yeah. it's the loss of field of vision which means it's difficult to navigate and see things coming in mm -hmm. they also have more subtle symptoms like when they're reading, their vision will go blurred. That's due to what's called fatiguing of the optic nerve. 
Um, they may have reduced contrast sensitivity and different lighting mm -hmm. and delayed adaptation from dark to light and light to dark and glare is another symptom of that as well. So those are kind of subtle symptoms that they may not report but if you ask them about it that they may have. And in terms of signs on examination, what are the key things to look out for? So the diagnosis is made really by assessing the optic nerve. Yeah. Um, the intraocular pressure is commonly raised, but quite commonly not raised in glaucoma. So oh, it's okay. not an absolute diagnostic feature. And that's why the definition is based on uh, the optic neuropathy. Because some people can have elevated intraocular pressure and normal optic nerves, and some people can have normal optic nerves, but uh, sorry, normal pressures, but um, advanced glaucoma. So you would check the pressure because that's the most important risk factor mm -hmm. and you would look for signs of secondary glaucomas or you would examine the angle to look for angle closure and then examining the optic disc is the most important feature which is generally done clinically then we use um, functional testing like visual field testing and maybe imaging of the optic nerve to help us confirm the diagnosis and also to monitor to look for changes and progression of the disease. And how do we manage patients with primary open angle the, the traditional management is um, eye drops. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of eye drops and we would tend to start a patient on one drop and see how they get on and maybe we would need to add in one or two more drops to that if we're not getting adequate control. Mm -hmm. And what those drops do is either reduce the amount of fluid being, aqueous fluid being produced okay. in the, uh, by the ciliary body or improve the outflow through the angle or what's called the uveoscleral pathway. And that reduces the pressure in the eye. Uh, more recently, primary laser treatment called trabeculoplasty is getting more popularity as an alternative to drops and here at Morpheus we're running, running a randomised controlled trial comparing medication versus um, laser. If eye drops don't work or laser doesn't work and the patient is progressing then we would consider glaucoma surgery. And um, what can cause secondary glaucoma? You mentioned them. What kind of things can lead to secondary glaucoma? It's usually other eye conditions. So um, there's a couple of conditions which can be categorised as primary or secondary, mm -hmm. where you get dispersion of pigment into the drainage angle. That often happens in uh, short-sighted young to middle-aged men. Okay. Uh, that's called pigment dispersion mm -hmm. glaucoma. Um, there's a condition called pseudoexfoliation, which is deposits of abnormal extracellular material in the angle and then other conditions so for example inflammatory conditions of the eye um, like uveitis, uh, trauma mm -hmm. can increase your risk of glaucoma, previous surgery so many patients may have had corneal surgery, retinal surgery um, and then children can get glaucoma either as a primary they're born with it or children who have cataracts and need surgery can go on to develop what's called aphakic glaucoma. Okay. So there's a number of different types of secondary glaucoma and, and they can often present with quite high pressure and be quite difficult to treat. And also I've left out one category which is what's called neovascular glaucoma. So okay. if patients are diabetic or have had a retinal vein thrombosis and they get secondary neovascularization, it can close off the angle and cause a secondary angle closure. And are you seeing much more of that with the increasing diabetic population? Or? Yes, except that the, um, the control of proliferative disease is quite more effective now okay. with prompt laser treatment and yeah. anti-VEGF treatments like Avastin. You can often halt the neovascularization a bit earlier than we could do before. Thank you so much. So we like to finish by asking, say I'm a final year med student mm. or a GP trainee or an F2 in a &E. what are the kind of key take home messages that I need to know about chronic glaucoma? I think probably, uh, you know, if you're a GP for example, mm. that you might get a patient come with a referral or and how do you interpret that? Mm. I think it's important to know the risk factors yeah. and the risk factors are a family history, so a first degree relative, ethnicity, yeah. probably main one, or another eye condition. Um, and also to be aware 
it's not so much really in terms of making the diagnosis, but just be aware that even though your patient may retain good central acuity, if they've got advanced glaucoma, they will effectively have a, a disability and are el eligible to be registered sight impaired. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the holistic approach to the patient or any support they might need, you yeah. want to take that into account. And also it's important that they comply with their treatment yes. and their eye drops and that's maybe important for a GP or another doctor to reinforce that to them. Yeah, that's great. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks for okay. your time. You're welcome.